In this video, I'm going to briefly explain this Laplacian operator. To understand the Laplacian operator, we need some background knowledge. First, I highly recommend that you watch this video beforehand. Also in this video, I'm gonna go over these two existing vector identities before explaining the Laplacian operator. We know that the divergence of a vector tells us about the spreading. If we are talking about a vector field that describes a fluid flow, in some sense, this is about stretching or compressing from the fluid's perspective. If the divergence is zero, then it means the fluid is incompressible, or we can say that the flow is incompressible. You can clearly see here that it's neither stretched or compressed, right? So the divergence of zero means that. Similarly, the curl of a vector being zero means it's an irrotational flow. Because the curl of a vector tells us whether the field is rotating or not, right? These are easy to understand. Now, let's take a look at the two vector identities I mentioned at the beginning. First, I'll explain this one. I'm going to give you both a mathematical and a visual explanation, okay? Assuming that you either have watched my video that I recommended or already have the background knowledge, the gradient of a scalar is just this, right? And this is now a vector, as you can see clearly. Now, if you're taking the curl of that vector, then we can write it like this, correct? And you see, each term cancels itself out and disappears. I haven't defined this function f, and we got zero. This means it doesn't matter what the function is. No matter what, the curl of the gradient of a scalar function always gives us zero. When the curl of something is zero, what does that mean? It means it's irrotational. Surprisingly, the gradient of any scalar function is always irrotational. Now, you're probably wondering what this means physically. So here's the visual explanation. Like I explained in the other video, when we have a scalar field, the gradient of that scalar field shows all the trends toward the higher scalar values, right? And this vector identity is saying that these vector flows are irrotational. And in fact, if we flatten this blue hill that I drew with some necessary rescaling, we would see that the vectors don't curve. This concept is related to finding the most efficient path to reach the destination. And as an example, it appears when we discuss space-time curvature in general relativity. Okay, now the second vector identity. Again, I'll explain this both mathematically and visually. So here we have some vector v. It's a vector, so we could express it like this. The curl of this vector should look like this, right? And the divergence of that should be this. You see, this and this cancel, this and this cancel, and this and this cancel. So we get zero. It's very similar to our first vector identity, but in the first identity, the x, y, and z components each canceled out within their own parts. But here, everything is mixed and cross-canceled. And that's totally fine, because in this case, the equation isn't separated into the x, y, z components. Anyway, for this vector identity, we got zero again. Since we proved this using a vector that has a generic form, this vector identity should work for any existing vector. And this one is pretty easy to explain it visually. You know, if we do a cross product of two vectors, it gives us a new vector that is perpendicular to both of them, right? So if we do a cross b, we get this vector c that is perpendicular to the vector a and also perpendicular to vector b at the same time, right? Now let's compare this to our second vector identity. We have the cross product here, so let's say this whole thing gives us c, okay? We said that this del operator is a, so it's like we have a here as well. This means a dot c. Correct? Makes sense? But then a and c are perpendicular to each other, right? So this should be 0, of course. So this vector identity is always correct, no matter what we have as v. 
All right, let's summarize what we've discussed so far. If the divergence of some vector is zero, that means it's an incompressible flow. If the curl of some vector is zero, that means the vector field is not rotating, it's an irrotational flow. And this vector identity told us that the gradient of all the scalar fields in this world are irrotational. And this is just how the cross product gives us a new vector that is perpendicular to the original vectors. Now, I would like to ask you to think about this. We've just looked at these two vector identities, right? Aren't you curious about slightly different versions of them? For example, in the first vector identity, we did the cross product here. We could try the dot product and see what happens, right? And also, in the second vector identity, we tried the dot product with this thing in the bracket, right? And we could try it with something else too, like the dot product with the gradient of a scalar. Why not? So it's going to look like this. Look, both of these are clearly telling us to try something, right? So we shall try this one. Here I wrote the del operator just for reference. The gradient of a scalar is this, as we all know by now. And the divergence of that should simply be this. So the divergence of the gradient of a scalar is essentially the second partial derivatives. And you know what? If you think about it, we could also write it this way. Because if you do the dot product of the two del operators, we also get the second partial derivative expression. So these two are equal, right? Do you agree? So these two are equal, and the simplest form is this. There we are, at last, our main topic in this video. This operator is called the Laplacian operator, named after the French mathematician Pierre Simon Laplace. All right, so what could this second partial derivative tell us? If we set this equal to zero, this becomes Laplace's equation. If we set this equal to some arbitrary scalar function, g, this becomes Poisson's equation. Okay, if we set this to zero, what could this mean? Like I showed just before, the del squared came from this, right? And if we look at this expression instead, some meaningful things start to appear. First of all, we learned that the gradient of a scalar is always irrotational, right? But as you can see, the divergence of it is zero. We forced it to be zero, right? Which means we just made it incompressible. We made the Laplace's equation to talk about something that is not only irrotational, but also incompressible. So how about when this is not equal to zero, like the Poisson's equation? I'll tell you the difference. Poisson's equation is used for the field when some source is present. So G describes the source. Laplace's equation is used for the field when nothing is there. But then wait, what's the point of using this equation when nothing is happening in there, right? Well, there could still be something happening, but it just might be happening somewhere else, outside the region we're looking at. That could be the case, right? But then in the Poisson's equation, we could gather information about the field because there is a source to refer to. But in Laplace's equation, how can we get any information about the field when there is nothing to refer to, right? This is why, for the Laplace's equation, we need to have something called boundary conditions. If we at least know how the field looks on the boundaries, the edges here, we should then be able to start drawing the shape of the field, right? So yeah, Poisson's equation describes the field when something is present. Laplace's equation describes the field when there is nothing, but we will need boundary information to study. Lastly, I could give you some examples. Poisson's equation appears in electromagnetism. We use this equation to describe the electric field when a charge is present. Poisson's equation also appears in gravitation. 
we use it to describe the gravitational field when a massive object is present. Laplace's equation is widely used in fluid dynamics and thermodynamics. As an example, say there's a furnace outside the house, it's hitting one side of the wall, the other side is cold as you can see, then after some time, we'll be able to observe how the heat spreads and settles inside the house. You see, there's nothing inside, but there still is heat flow. As long as we have information about the boundaries, the wall in this case, we can calculate how the heat is distributed in the house. You see, Laplace's equation is also very useful. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, you could offer me a like button and perhaps even subscribe to my channel. I would really appreciate it. It really motivates me. Thanks.